everybody. We, well, my name is Sharon Spence Wilcox. I'm one of the librarians here. And the library is hosting, once again, our conversations on social issues. This time, well, in general, the series that we host is an extension of our library's charge to promote freedom of information and the open exchange of ideas. And though none of us is going to agree with everything that is written in all of our books and databases, we provide them so that the community we serve can learn from a wide range of viewpoints. And this same philosophy is expressed by providing this space for a discussion series on social issues. All points of view are welcome, and everyone should feel free to express their own opinion. At the same time, I'm asking that you be respectful of what others have to say, and if you'd like to learn more about this topic, we have some books. Because we are the library. We have some books you might want to look at. And I've also passed out these yellow slips, which is, uh, I'm, I'm doing that because we're trying to get some feedback on this series from you guys who attend. So there's a little URL on there, and after the series is over, I'm asking that you take that, go to that URL and fill out a really brief survey about your experience here today. Next week, we're going to have Jay McLean Riggs. She's a global health professor here at Seattle Central, and she's going to talk about community colleges in higher education, the role of Seattle Central, historically and in the future. But today, we will have Carl Livingston. Carl Livingston is a political science professor here at Seattle Central, and he's going to talk about the rediscovery of the primacy of economic development and civil rights. Carl, welcome. Oh. Thank you so much. I, uh, I love uh, these talks. And uh, I appreciate so much uh, our library. We have the best librarians in the country. I don't know if you know that. So uh, uh, say something good to our librarians and make the most of uh, what we have here um, at our school because uh, we really have a great resource for you all. Uh, I come today, uh, and then I come today to talk to you about uh, economic justice and uh, how it relates to the civil rights movement, the black community, and, uh, and so, uh, and, and it's a big deal to me because it's been what I've been um, about these last about eight years or so I've been heavily uh, involved in trying to launch a development movement and I have been thus far rather unsuccessful but I'm not stopping I don't expect these things to happen very quickly so I'm still on it still on the case so I want to present this to you but mainly in the light of this new book that just came out uh, William Jones's book uh, the March on Washington, Jobs, Freedom, and the Forgotten History of Civil Rights. Um, and so uh, why don't I just start it because going through the PowerPoint would probably be the most efficient way for me to do this. And so this book is on order for the library. I don't uh, think it's gone through processing yet, but we should have it in our collection soon if we'd like to read more. See, maybe I don't know how to do that. So this is the purpose of the talk today. Um, the purpose is to present you this information, so for just the eight kids that want to know about it in a, in a more rational, detached way, you know, you'll learn something new then, because uh, they're revisiting history. But for those uh, who are very interested in trying to further the aims of the Civil Rights Movement, uh, this, I hope, is going to be very useful information. Very useful information. Um, uh, and, um, and then next, um, I want you to know things I'm doing uh, that fit into this, okay? All right, um, so this is a little bit about me. I don't need to spend a lot of time on that. And uh, I'm also an area pastor. I don't know if you guys know about that. In the black community, though, what that does is that gets me really involved in the community. Because you can't be like a, a religious leader in the black community without a significant without one without being involved. And, uh, and oh, and just ignore this part right here. I just realized I got something on there that's from another 
another talk. So forget that Diopian stuff. That was last time. Okay. You can ask me about it later. I kind of don't want to talk about it now. Um, so that's, uh, that's pretty much it. Then um, before we go into the disturbing facts, I want to remind you of one more thing. That is that the United States of America is probably more capitalist than it is anything else. It's probably more capitalist than it, did, than it is anything else. It's probably more capitalist than it is democratic. Uh, it's probably uh, more capitalist than it is uh, about equality or, or, or any of those other values, humanitarianism, uh, socialism, anything like that. It's more about capitalism. Capitalism, as you know, is the private ownership of the means of production of the things produced, goods provided. And, it, uh, and, it's, and it's a system in which um, the free market, the invisible hand, determines supply and demand. Uh, usually in the definition of it, uh, in that definition of the public ownership of the means of production, they leave out in capitalism the importance of borrowed money. And they really should. Because what really makes capitalism work is capital itself, the people that own most of the capital. And they're providing that capital to individuals and other businesses so that they can make money. It's the folks that make money on their money. They're the ones that really run the system. They benefit from, they benefit from capitalism the most. And so capitalism is this kind of a system. It's a system about private ownership. And in a capitalist system, it's the owner that matters. It's the owner. It's the business owner that matters. matters. The business owner is the object. The business owner is the main one served. And maybe I shouldn't say object. It's the end. It's the one being served the most, the beneficiary. Uh, in a capitalist system, labor, the workers, are an expense, like the stapler. And they put in keep it, having a place to run the business. And all of that stuff necessary to produce whatever good or service you're producing. Labor is an expense. Well, that's an interesting thing when you get a democratic country where it's supposed to be owned by the people. So do the people own this system? Or do the owners own the system? The, the business owners? <laughs> And that's a debate we need to have. But I think in a country in which most of everything produced is in the hands of firms and individuals, I think that that really kind of defines us more than our own democracy. Then if you lay on to that sexism, <coughs> it gets real interesting. The dynamic, if it's mainly a capitalist system in which owners matter, then you have to deal with sexism in the midst of that. Classism, well, that's already there in the capitalism. But what about racism and those other isms? Uh, it really skews the system. It really skews the system in terms of owners and in terms of owners probably mainly male, in terms of owners that are mainly um, white and, and on and on and on. Just want to keep that in the back of your mind because I try to get my arms around what's going on around here and how not just to explain the problem, but how to fix it. How do you fix it? All right. Now, let's hit some disturbing facts really quickly. I don't need to say a lot about these, some of the stuff you generally know. Uh, blacks are the last hired and the first fired. Um, how many of y'all are familiar with the New York study of them? Anybody heard about it? I think it's a 2005 study, I believe. Let's see if I can uh, click this on and go straight to the article. Hey, what did I do? Oh, maybe I just went one forward. All right, that should take us straight there to the article. Look at that. 
City University of New York. Study finds New York City employers discriminate against ex-offender or white job applicants, applicants with a record do better than blacks with none. Now, that's a pretty bad title. That's not well written. But here's the point, though. Here's the point. And this study, this was an extensive study. And this study, in the 2000s, in big old New York, a northern city, whites with a criminal record got jobs over blacks, no criminal record. All other things are equal and held constant. They just said, okay, here's going to be your resume, go look for a job. And for the white with a criminal record, they got more jobs than the blacks did. I'm going to say to you again, blacks are the last time and first five. Steel. We got the studies. To argue around that study, you know what we do up here at this level is we, we talk about studies and schools of thought and, and things like that, and that becomes heavy. That, that weighs heavy what it is we think we know. And so that study is a significant one to add to all the other stuff that shows that uh, not just that race matters. Race can put you on the bottom economically in the system in which I think economics is the driver. And it's more capitalist than anything else. Blacks are suffering most in a recession. Now here's the crazy thing. In a recession, blacks become the first fired in the last hire. And no more times in the last hire than the first fire. And in a recession, they become the first fired in the last hire. They're part of what we call the lagging indicators. It's a euphemism that really causes us not to think. We just act like, well, it's just like it's like the wind. But what it means is that the last to come out, they were already far behind. And then they're the last to come out of a recession. So they become farther, they grow farther behind in the recession. This last great recession has worked a great a misjustice. It would break disjustice on African Americans. Blacks uh, have the smallest multiplier in their community. Now they got to take some of the blame for that, too. So one of the things I'm doing is dealing with how much a dollar circulates in the black community. A dollar does not circulate very well in the black community, partly because their businesses, they don't have as many different types of businesses that are providing goods and services that the same kind of quality and price as other communities. But Jewish communities, Jewish Americans and others have learned that you, you can't let that stop you when it comes to choosing your own businesses. You're the most likely to support, the people that look like you are the most likely to support your businesses. And you're the most likely to support theirs. It's kind of like a, 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 a natural thing. Uh, you got to go the extra mile to support your business, and that, all that does is help you grow as a people. African Americans need to learn this more than other groups. Uh, they got to support their businesses. You can internalize your own racism and internalize your own uh, what we call we call it stratification when you're at the bottom. At least they call it sociology stratification. Um, you can inter internalize your own bottom stratification by saying, you know, yeah, I don't think I'm gonna go support my business either business by people that look like me because it might not be as good. Their ice may not be as cold. And all you do is you hurt your own self. And to a degree, African Americans have done that. But part of being in this society causes women sometimes to distrust women just because they're women. Minorities to distrust minorities because they're minorities, at least certain types. And uh, the poor to distrust the poor just because they're poor. And they have to work around that. All right. So, how many times the dollar multiplies in the community is a big deal. And I've been trying to understand that. I've also been trying to understand this, something that Claude Anderson, really a math professor uh, from the Detroit area, he's got a book out called uh, Powernomics. You'll see it referenced at the bottom of uh, the cover of my book. Uh, he said blacks have the lowest percentage of business relative to their numbers. Business owners, businesses, businesses relative to their numbers. One of the interesting communities to study in this regard, the interesting communities to study is the Vietnamese American community. 
came here poor and lost a number of businesses. They did it pretty late. I'm talking about 70s and 80s. Another interesting community to study in this regard is the, the, the Habesha community, mainly though uh, Somali and Ethiopian Americans. Maybe Eritreans too, but I don't know their situation as well. Anybody Eri Eri Eritrean in here? Eritrean? Anybody Eritrean? All right, but I know the Ethiopian and uh, Somali situation a little bit. Well, taxi cab parking lots. Come on, somebody. You you, you know you, you faced them. Right? You gotta be proud of the restaurants. A high percentage relative to the numbers in the population. Communities that do that do well. Why? Because I think it's because we're mainly Catholics. You can't wait for the government to do it for you. And uh, uh, and African Americans have a smaller percentage. Now some of it has to do with uh, racism, whether it's unintentional, what we call institutional racism, or whether it's intentional. Um, so, but that is a factor. That's another factor, all right, in this disturbing situation. Now, blacks are performing among the lowest on standardized tests. So, it, it, so you, this, this kind of stuff has, economic, has educational implications and ramifications. When your parents are struggling to make it, they tend to have problems. There's going to be drama in the household. And when they're struggling to make it, they tend to sometimes have to take any kind of job. And they may be working late into the night. Uh, their cars may break down. They may not be able to afford insurance, so they might be on the trans transit system or have to walk. Uh, they, they, they have a number of people live in communities which have food deserts and, in a sense, business deserts. And for them to get work, they've got to go outside of their community. So it takes a while to get home. You've got more latchkey kids. Latchkey kids take care of themselves. Latchkey kids sometimes do some things they shouldn't be doing. I know. To the degree I was a latchkey kid. Try to get away as much as you can. Smoking things shouldn't be smoking. Talking to folks shouldn't be talking to. Outside the house when you should be inside. And then when you're struggling economically, it makes it hard to hold the relationships together. It makes it hard to hold the relationships together. You're like, I can do bad by myself. You ain't adding to the pot. And uh, then when you got a single parent, you can have a hero in that home. Uh, my mom was a hero. She was doing everything she could to hold the family. She had six kids. But boy, we got 12, 13 years old. You couldn't tell us. We are at Tacoma. home. we the home at the baddest boxing team in the world, fighting with some of them guys, acting up. And my mom was doing a great job. She told us you better this and that, have the house clean, and do what you're supposed to do, be home, get on your homework. Man, we started acting out. And my mom had a hard time getting us to do the right thing. My dad had an easier time. It just ain't money. Right. And that affects the kid's education. Sometimes you gotta know what's causing and which one's symptomatic. Sometimes they're not equally the same and mutually causative, or one is not really, no one is really mostly causative. I think economics right now, for many of the poor, is the main reason why they're in the situation they're in, and not the social factors of what's happening in the relationships. I think that's the okido, the superficial explanation, the false explanation they buy into. And then you're, you never find the cause. And it just gets worse and worse. Uh, I think the cause of things is economics. And so that's why I'm focused on economic development. All right. Now, let's get some other things real quick. U.S. incarcerates more than any other country in the world. Twice more than the second country. U.S. incarcerates blacks at a rate more than three times their percentage. When you're, when you're struggling economically, and when you are struggling educationally, uh, guess what? You're going to find some kind of way to make it. And usually it's not going to be quite right. You're going to be like uh, Al Boazizi uh, doing your trade sometime without a license because you're having a hard time getting a license. You're going to be selling your t-shirts, selling your, your shoes that you got from Harold. You think they're legit. 
out the back of the trunk, you're an easy target for police. And to them, you're just a thug. If you don't have a license, did not stop you before. Why are you doing this again? You just can't do the right thing. Uh, you're going to be selling marijuana. Uh, it's legal, I guess, now for those 18 and over, or is it 21 and over? 21 and over if you're doing it the, within the requirements. But if not, you're back with the old set, old set of criminal laws. You're doing other things you shouldn't be doing. Next thing you know, you're going to run afoul of the law. And in the black communities, even in Seattle, they have something called broken windows policing. It's like a dragnet type of policing where you get more policing in certain neighborhoods with the expectation that they're going to make stops, write tickets, and make arrests. And they're looking at your numbers. And when more people are stopped, more people are fined, more people are ticketed, it's going to lead to more arrests. It's going to get frustrated. Guess what a ticket is for driving without a ticket, without a license? What is the ticket for driving without, I'm sorry, let me start again. What is the ticket for driving without insurance? You all have done it. You know, when you, you're just two days away from driving. You know, you're going to get insurance. You're going to get insurance in two days with payday, right? $550. It's $550, that ticket. Wow. Now, for some of you, that's not a problem. Man, you, you have no idea. When you're the last hire and first fire, how much money that is. You have no idea. That just might mean you are not going to have a car anymore. And you got three or four kids. One might be sick with asthma, diabetes, sick of cell anemia. You're behind eight ball again. Sometimes when you don't pay your tickets, guess what happens? Jail. You get the yeah, you first, you first double. Mm -hmm. Then after a while, they kick them over to the uh, Collection agency, and then after, then at that point they got a choice to make. Uh, excuse me, y'all. I'm about to get, I'm, I'm about to get knocked out by my own books. <laughs> this my book? I don't think yeah, so. it's from the library. Okay, all right, all right. Wouldn't that be sad? Um, sometimes you can get a warrant for your arrest from your tickets. Back behind the eight ball. Again. All right. Now, and then Washington State is one of the worst in the whole country. See, this is what you probably don't know. Washington State, it's just because of our ferocious, our rugged individualism. Washington State, we're just concerned about ourselves. You know, it was the Wild West. I got my little place. I ain't worried about you. I ain't going to mess with you, but I ain't worried about you. You could be struggling. As long as you don't bother me, I'm not going to bother you. And in Washington... The system is so skewed against the African Americans that they are incarcerated rate two times that of Mississippi's relative to their numbers and population. This is the case I make everywhere I go. We're going to have African American Legislative Day on the 14th. I'm going to take a personal day. I'll be down on Olympia, making the case all over again, trying to get Washingtonians to care. So Reverend Dr. Sam Barry McKinney, they're about to name this street after him on uh, Madison, down a ways, closer to Mount Zion. I think it'll pass. Uh, uh, he says, we're the last, the least, the lost, the left out, and the locked up. And I had the locked out. But that was him. So. I'm hoping that you start getting sense that maybe you might need some economic justice. Again, uh, just I want you to know about this preliminary report, because very few people know about it. In the 2000 an eight race, uh, uh, sorry, 2008 elections, one of the Supreme Court justices was up, I think Sanders, he went to Seattle University over there, so Washington State Supreme Court Justice, he spoke in a room that looked something like this, somebody in the room asked him, why do you think it is that more blacks are arrested? He said, because they have a greater propensity to commit crime, which is to get the system a pass. The system is not racist or anything. There were people that heard that and had a problem with that. Because they know the history of this area. They know what's going on. But see, you know, I've got this big case to make. So people were like, wait a minute. And there's something called the Lauren Miller Bar Association. It's the Black Bar Association. Uh, oh, man, the name of the president at the time almost came to me. I can picture her face right now. Stood up and said, you know, they voted on it. They said that we got to take a stand against this uh, because of the institutional racism in this place. So she came out against what uh, Sanders said. 
Sanders then went and got a black lawyer, I think it was Lim Howe, to write something in his favor. But more, the, then they went to the minority bars, the African Americans did. And the Latino and the Asian bar, and some of the others said, we support you. Because we know right now we got problems with Native Americans getting harassed. We had all those shootings in the 90s that some of y'all don't know anything about. The names and the, and the racist language and all of this stuff. And, and this was before the Justice Department came in. You know, the Justice Department, you know, the city, city, city of Seattle has the United States Justice Department watching its policing. We look terrible nationally. And still, Washingtonians and Seattleites are so ruggedly, ruggedly individualist, we don't believe it. You just get to yourself. You don't want to experience yourself as being racist or anything like that. You want to experience yourself as being so open-minded about this and knowledgeable. But the truth of the matter is, we almost feel like, ah, it's just something. It's not a big deal. It's really not real. It's good to be honest have this problem. All right, so then what happened is when the other minority bars stood up on this, then that Supreme Court justice realized, ee, yeah, yeah, the last thing you want to do is get the minorities mad. Have the minorities at the gates. So they said, okay, we're going to pick a committee and look into it. What did they do that for? They picked the committee of some of the most important people. Head Seattle University Law School, University of Washington Law School, uh, law firms downtown, uh, Gonzaga, because they had an East River Washington representation. They put this blue ribbon committee together, and that committee just started culling the information. And as soon as they looked at the information, they knew they were wrong. White people and black people and those in between use drugs at about the same rate. However, arrests of black people like three to four times the arrest of white as soon as you look at the numbers, you start realizing, hey. Then it came up, something that they had forgot about. 1980, Washington State had the highest incarceration rate. I'm sorry, Seattle I think, had the highest incarceration rate of any city in the country. Now, the highest incarceration rate of African Americans relative to the numbers in the population. It's not a total number of things relative to the numbers of the population. There's Seattle, so Seattle couldn't believe they were number one. They were like, How could we be number one? Now we just wanted the 10 worst. So we went, Woo, we make progress. And black people in pain. So this is a situation, and they came out and said, Okay, 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 you're right. The, institution, the system is institutionally racist. And this Blue Ribbon Committee came out with this finding. This thing should be all over the place. It should be on the news. Nobody's talking about it. It should be discussed all over. Man, we should be huddling around. It's the big agreement. Now listen, they're going to write about it in 30 years when they tell the history. And people going to be like, where did that come from? It's right there. It's there. It's in the face. And here's what they said. We find the assertion that black disproportionality and incarceration is due solely to different environment is inaccurate. We find that facially neutral policies that have disparate impact that have this uh, contribute significantly to these disproportionalities. We find that racial and ethnic bias distorts decision making at various levels from the rest all the way to the judge making the decision. We find that race and racial bias matters in ways that are not fair, that do not advance legitimate public safety objectives that produce disparities in the criminal justice system. Ladies and gentlemen, this Blue Ribbon Committee just a handful of years ago I was in the Supreme Court building when they reported on it in Olympia. They said we're institutionally racist. We're not saying we're intentionally racist. We don't mean the racism now, is what they're trying to say. Or at least we can't prove that we mean it. But we know it's racist. It treats you unfairly just because of your color. Still there? Y'all all right? Mm -hmm. Now this is just a little 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 thing. This is just me doing me. <laughs> now I'm at a meeting with Norm Stamper. He used to be Seattle's police chief. He got a book out on policing and why police sometimes shoot black people more. And uh, he said in a meeting, and I was in the room, uh, that Nixon had this war on poverty and all, and, and he and he wanted to come up with something. Now I just I don't know what to do with this, but I can't let it go. I always like to bring it up. And this came right out of the diary, and this wasn't published until about, I think this was published about five years ago now. Haldeman was writing 
as Nixon was talking, or else he was either writing as Nixon talked, or he wrote when he got out of the meeting with United States President Richard Nixon. Haldeman is like his chief of staff or something like that. He said, go into a deep discussion of welfare, trying to think out the family security decision with E, that's Ehrlichman, another person that's high level person with President Nixon, this is 69, and me. P, that's the president, emphasized that you have to face the fact that the whole problem is really the blacks. The key is to devise a system that recognizes this while not appearing, I'm gonna read it again, because you, you ain't gonna believe me. P emphasized that you have to face the fact that the whole problem is really the blacks. The key is to devise a system that recognizes this while not appearing to, what, what, what's going on? What's going on? Problem with overall welfare plan is that it forces poor whites in the same position as blacks, feels we have to get rid of the veil of hypocrisy, guilt, and face reality, and then, and then you know they're not that, they're really not that smart. They don't come from a place that's done anything. They come from Africa. All right. <coughs> and so what does he end up doing? He takes away some of the school programming that was helping them build their own schools, particularly down south. He tries to begin to cut back on the social service net that was being put together from the Johnson administration. Now, he does one good thing, though. He launches affirmative action. He didn't mean to. It was a person from the state of Washington, his name Maybe his name will come to me later. Who was Assistant Secretary of Labor. And he launched it. It was called the Philadelphia Plan. And he launched the affirmative action stuff. But Nixon was trying to do it. But the worst thing that Nixon did is Nixon put together the Drug Control Act and made mar marijuana a category A, highly addictive, highly dangerous drug. So that marijuana is always there anytime they need to use it to do whatever they want to do. I can't take this any farther. I just want you to see that. I, I ain't saying nothing else. I'm done. I don't know what all this means. I don't know. They didn't say. I don't know. But I'm suspicious. All right. This woman right here came out with a book somewhere around 2008. No, 2010. Ohio State law professor. She got Seattle in the book around page 100. Between 100 and 104. I got to go back and look at it. I think it's about 104. But I'm, I know it's close. As, as a place of, uh, in which you've got uh, mass incarceration. They need economic justice. So I was speaking, I was speaking in um, uh, just down the street. And I thought, man, I don't really take this seriously. It was about like 2003, so no, 2002, 2001. And I said, hey, you need to come up with a plan for your own economic development. I was speaking to Black Dollar Days, that's what. Uh, I think I was speaking up at uh, Goodwill Baptist Church. I said, y'all need a plan. You don't have a plan. You can't do anything without a plan. You can't plan a garden without a plan. You gotta have a plan for your own economic development. And so I, then I got done, had a couple rhymes in it. You know, I'm trying to make sound. Really. Then I uh, went and started eating. And you know, I can't eat through our speak, but when I get through speaking, I can eat. That's why I gotta work on that. And so I started eating, I'm eating real good, and they came to me and said, Talk to the board, you write the book. I mean, you write the plan. They didn't inspect the book. They just wanted some like plan, but I didn't want to do that. But that's what got me really focused on economics. Plus, I teach a political economy course, and I pulled from that course, went up to the University of Washington, took, talked to two economists up there, vet my outline, asked them to help me. They wouldn't, but at least they vetted my outline, came with some ideas, that are mainly capitalist in nature, because I feel like that's mainly what the country is. You might hate it. You, you might hate, but you better get good at it till you change it. You might hate it, but you better get good at it till you change it. Because it's coming at you. And it intends, if you don't have a plan for your own self, to make you an unskilled laborer who will be struggling. You'll at least serve the system because you'll keep down the pressure on the wages for the home. You, you might hate it, but you better get good at it. Hey, what did I do? That ain't in the, what, what is that? 
That's not in the PowerPoint. So that just means uh, warning. Uh, I don't know what's going on now. Maybe this is where I say it, but you don't want to hear me say it. <laughs> Any questions so far? Yes. Oh, well, it's not a question. Mm -hmm. Oh, there you go. Uh, go ahead. I'll let you finish. Mm -hmm. You can ask me that. Oh, okay. So, according to the Small Business Association, the U.S. government, African Americans actually have a greater entrepreneurial pursuit. It's just that they have greater failure in execution. Okay. So, I mean, you have to take that into account when you're talking about black But businesses. let me have those statistics, because what I gave you came from Carter's. <laughs> And Clyde Anderson actually has an institute. Uh, he had a, he's got a book out called Poweronomics, and his whole institute is like the Poweronomics movie. And he just receives this stuff. Okay, so but just show me your studies, because I'm interested. Because it might actually be saying the same thing. Because you can't just look at that momentarily. Uh, I, what I'm trying to say is you have to look at both sides of those statistics. Because it could be a wash. Or it could be a negative. Okay? If they're launching more businesses than other groups, but then they're going out of business faster than other groups, it, could, it may well be a wash. Okay? And uh, so you've got to go look at the numbers and see what they're saying. All right? So, so give me that, because what I'm doing is I'm trying to collect all this research and compile it. I'm trying to develop a, a I'm trying to come up with a development institute, a uh, Trying to launch a uh, like a development bank of materials to help any community that wants to develop. Right now, all I got is a shelf, and, uh, and then I want to write something on it that compiles it, because nobody's really compiling it, so that you will know where to go for what type of thing. And when you're not sure about something, it breaks out the different schools of how to approach it. So you just figure out one approach. And know that that's just one approach. It might not be right. Okay? You know what to do if it ain't right. I'll try this other approach. Until you know. But I'm trying to take this seriously because people are hungry. And they're unemployed. And they're going to jail. And it's killing. It ain't no academic thing to me. And I don't intend to bring $50 to the black people. I'm trying to bring hundreds of millions of dollars. And I'm willing to lay my black on that street if I have to. Because I got a feeling what's going to happen is I'm going to get Seattleites in the room and they're going to make some promises to me once they see all the information and the facts. But then they're not going to follow through. And that's what separated King from Jesse Jackson and all the others. You couldn't give King money underneath the table. You couldn't get him to stop her. Not unless that group he was with agreed. They had an objective and they intended to achieve it, even if you call him a troublemaker, even if you put him in jail. And he was going to achieve it even if, had, even if he had to get kids out of elementary school to march with him. Man, y'all really don't understand what Martin Luther King was about and why he was hated. There were even black people that were the touch game. The established black people did not want to be part of the main thrust of the King's movement. Not the establishment blacks. The reason why so many of the blacks that were around King are still alive today is because of the young. Those that had little churches that supported Martin Luther King. Like Buddha and Socrates, we lionized them after they did. We painted and changed and everything, act like, oh, he was great. And we all loved him. So I was down in DC. You see all this, see this problem of what's happening to black people. Don't the need for economic justice, and I run into this guy. I'm there for the 50th anniversary of March on Washington. He's smart. He knows his 50th, the 50th anniversary. He's going to sell a lot of books if he can time it right. He timed it just right. This professor, University of Wisconsin, I met down there in an A. Philip Randolph uh, conference, A. Philip Randolph, A. Philip Randolph Institute conference. And um, there's this book right here. He said, uh, the civil rights movement has always been about economic justice. And he surprised me. He surprised me. Because when I, see that's where my outline starts to fall apart, but when I did my study, when I wrote my book, I said the civil rights movement 
has been about political justice, but left economic justice, especially building businesses in the hood and developing them. And I said, non-blacks in the civil rights movement have not been about mainly building businesses in the hood and developing them along with everything else. In a mainly capitalist country, you've got to do that, or you're always going to be pulling them out of the hole. Pulling them out of the hole. Now let's help the foster kids. Now let's help them learn to read. Now let's teach them how to take care of kids. Now let's teach them, you've you got to help them with the businesses until you change this into another type of system. That's why I think power economics, you can't read it right here, but I think power economics is right. And, uh, uh, and, and some of it, all right. So, and let me pass Walter Jones' book. All right, so you come up with these schools. Here's what Walter Jones says. Walter Jones says, there are at least four different schools. One school of thought says that um, the civil rights movement was about political justice, mainly and most importantly, economic justice was just there a little bit. It was like that from the beginning. The beginning of the civil rights movement was mainly about Booker T. Washington, about 1880s and 90s. It's a little bit before Booker T. actually, but I can't go into that now because I'm going to run out of time and I got to stop here. So. Um, the second school of thought so was a mainly political justice movement. The second school of thought says the civil rights movement was um, mainly about economic justice and a little bit about political justice, right? So you got the mainly political justice. Now, political justice means we're going to get you out of segregation. We're going to change those laws that politically, by the law, are holding you down. We're going to stop these cities from treating you as a second class, third class citizen. Economic justice says, I'm going to help you so that you're paid a fair wage there's no, there's going to be no discrimination on your wage or your economic opportunities to get a job. Or even more importantly, to get your goods and services out there. Because remember, blacks were farmers in the 1800s. But if they're in a racist place, they only got 50% for their goods. And nobody wanted the services outside of the community. If you're a lawyer, I don't want you. Count, I don't want you. But I might want your greens or your cotton, but only at 50%. Black people were saying, I ain't worried about integration. I don't mean to live next to you. I don't even care if I can't go to your school. I just want a school that's as good in my neighborhood. And I want to be able to sell my greens and my cotton at the same price. All right? The third school said it was equally about political justice and political and economic justice it was equally about those two until Martin Luther King and that movement. And then they kind of left it behind, forgot it, and they never picked it up again after he died. The fourth view says that it was equally about political and economic justice even during King's time. Even during King's time. Anybody need me to go through the four views one more time? All right. Walter Jones' book is saying that view number two and view number four are more likely. That it's either a movement, number two, which was mainly about economic justice and somewhat about political justice. I mean, they wanted those chains off of them. They wanted the segregation gone. But what they wanted most was that stuff to be gone and a fair price for their, for their goods and services and, 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 and equality in terms of being able to compete with everybody else. And they wanted them a fair chance to get the jobs. And they didn't care as much about integration. You don't live with me, fine. I just want my money so I can take care of my family. That's the second view. And the fourth view is that economics was even more important and all the way, or equally important, equally important all the way through King. 
And guess what he made clear? Walter Jones makes clear that the march on Washington was always a march for jobs and justice. I forgot the byline, the subtitle of the march. I don't know if I read it too quickly or what. Then I went back and looked at the speech, and I could see it in King's speech. You know the first thing he said? It wasn't the I have a dream speech. I put, that's what we think it was just to make us feel better. Because when he got to the I have a dream, white people didn't have to do anything really. Not really. That was the tune-up. you got to know these black preachers. The end ain't really the sermon. That's the tune-up. That's going to the cross. That's tuning up. He wasn't even sure he was going to say I have a dream. He was waiting and debating on that because he needed a strong ending. The beginning of the speech, what some of these black preachers just read within the pulpit, that's really the speech. And guess what he started off with? We have come today to dramatize an appalling situation. He said when they wrote all the great ideals of the Constitution and all of that, he said America wrote a check. He said when black people went to the bank of justice, hey, this is economic time. He said they, their check for life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness was NSF. No money in the account. He didn't stop at a check. He said America wrote uh, the, the, the black, black people a promissory note. And he said you have not paid homage then he said, we live on a lonely island of despair in the midst of a sea of prosperity, a lonely item of despair and poverty. He said a lot about it. And he died trying to plan a poor people's march for economics. He said, I'm going to bring Native Americans and Latinos, poor whites from the Appalachians, and by economics, too. And we're going to camp in D.C. until they give us a jobs bill for everybody and benefits for everybody. That's when he got killed. And he said, we got to go to Memphis to help these garbage workers because that is the metaphor for what we're getting ready to do. These garbage workers being paid half of what whites are paid in this. We got to stop this. I'm going to stop right here and answer questions. I just want you to know that I'm working on something called a crisis. Me and eight professors, seven other professors got together. And we're now taking this to the city and the county. And we're telling the African American community to have a crisis. It's called a crisis. The need for immediate response to the economic, educational, and housing crisis in greater black Seattle. So I'm just starting that, and then down the road, I want to, um, so this development movement and development bank and all that is to push, to, to support that and give it infrastructure. Down the road, I want to bring it to the black community. I ain't trying to bring it to the black community right now. The black community is so in pain right now that they won't do anything. They're like Kavlov's dog. They've just been shocked down to them. i got to bring them jobs. If I look like the job man, then they're going to listen to me. If I look like the job man, they're just sick of people saying, I got to develop a plan to help you at all. They're not going to I'm going to bring benefits to them and sacrifice if I need that. I might lose my job. But sometimes you, know, you just get to a place where you're like, I can't do anything. I can't just live my normal life and not scream. Because we're going to help these folks. This is what they is. All right. Comments, comments. Yes, sir. So um, I kind of have an issue with um, the last part of your statement. <laughs> civil rights movement. I attribute that to um, Joe Ann Robinson. Because when you're talking about the long term of Montgomery boycott, that was black. And the economic attack was because of sexual assault. And Martin Luther King and his, the people around him took credit for but so when you're talking about the catalyst for the movement, it was because of the assault in the South on black women by white men. I'm not saying economics wasn't a factor, but that tactic to so that help me. I, I don't know if I got your point yet. What, what are you saying is... Because you're talking about Martin Luther King and the social, the, the economic 
economic justice, but that strategy was developed by black women in response to sexual assaults. And there's a book that was recently published on that. And they're saying that this the group of black women what? The strategy to attack to economic structures. Economic structures Attacking the economic structures, so the, the boycott, which Martin Luther King and the other leaders took credit for, and used, yeah. used and took credit for, yeah, and then was a strategy developed by black women, led by Joanne Robinson, uh, to prevent rapes. No, well, to not prevent, but to punish, find a way to punish the rape. The but why couldn't all that be true? Why couldn't it all still be true? No, it is true, but the idea that Martin Luther King is the leader behind that is not true. He just ended up taking leadership and then not I think what you're saying people. is the idea that he invented it yeah. is not true. Yeah, that's definitely I, what I'm saying. I, I, he, he didn't have anything. Yeah, but what I'm saying is too, and that whole four models of. Time. I don't even think Gandhi invented it. No, no, but the four models. Guess who I think invented it? The South Africa. Okay. I think Gandhi learned it from the ANC when he was in the army in India, and he didn't tell the truth. And there was something that Gandhi did. Pardon me? What did I just say? Indian? Yeah. I'm sorry. Yes. As a Indian, Gandhi went to South Africa as a colored. Oh, I mean, I know. And he saw the ANC, because the ANC started around 1911, I think, or 19, maybe even earlier than that. So when Gandhi was there, they had already had over 10 years, and they were still doing nonviolent. But, I mean, I'm saying when you're talking about the four schools of thought, that needs to be included because I think that is actually the nexus behind when you're talking about a civil rights movement. Yeah. But see, those four yeah. schools didn't have to do with who started it. Well, but I mean, the premise. But I'm glad you said who started it. So did everybody hear that? Mm -hmm. This may well have been started by black women who were trying to do something about the fact that they were being raped. And I'm cool with that. We're both I'm cool with that. It's called the dark end of the street. Okay. All right. Someone ask more questions, comments. Yes. Uh, I read that the, in the 80s or maybe 70s, uh, for this institutionalized uh, practice that came and brought into Los Angeles, into the black community, was that it was by certain institutions. Um, and <laughs> did that go into yeah, other? Yeah, yeah. I was going to say some a name, but I won't. So, um, <coughs> so was that brought in other communities too, as well, in an effort to destroy the the poor black areas? Well, first let me say it was complicated. Okay. It was complicated, and um, I don't think there was some real clear, easy, short way that all that happened. Uh, I remember when I was in Mr. Davis's class. He taught us that we could get to some number he had in his mind from his giving all yes answers or from his giving all no answers. And he brought us through some thought exercise in which he always said yes, and we got to this number he had in his mind or wrote down or something, and, 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 and no. When the United States government is doing something through covert operations, they do it in a really sophisticated way to give them plausible deniability. So they go, hey, now they go might go into a nation and go, now how are we going? How are we going to do this? Or like if they're torturing prisoners. Well, that's not effective. Go back and try it again. No, that's not going to do it. Go back and try it again. So when it gets done, it looks like it was your idea. And when you do something good, they go, oh, that was good. That idea you came up with. It was so complicated how it was done. But I'll tell you one thing you're not going to be able to get away from. And me either. Marijuana, which is really a little bit better for us than cigarettes, to tell you the truth. If not a lot better for us than cigarettes, was listed as a class A, highly addictive substance right up there with, I mean, you ought to see what else is in that class A. The Schaefer Commission, the Schaefer, here's what happened in the Congress. They said, we will pass this law for Nixon, but when the Schaefer Commission gets done, the Schiff Commission had professionals on it. Some politicians and some medical professionals. Psychologists and psychiatrists and all that. When the Schaefer Commission gets done, we'll make a final determination about marijuana. The Schaefer Commission was preparing its preliminary report saying marijuana shouldn't be on there. Nixon heard about it and contacted that head and said, I know you're not getting ready to do this. You're supposed to be a good American. You shouldn't do it. And even after the arm twisting, 
He could not get the Schaefer Commission to take marijuana off. They issued a report and said marijuana shouldn't be on there. It's not how they did it. It's not even a gateway drug. Go read the report. Y'all need to read the report. And they kept it on there. And they did the SWAT teams. And they made sure that folks that don't, they don't make these drugs. Not the cocaine. They grow some of the marijuana, but most of the marijuana is grown outside the community. And it just comes to them. The guns come to them. And, um, and the policing comes in a big way. And a lot of it had to do with Martin Luther King turning on Nixon. Maybe Martin Luther King should not have said what he said about Vietnam. I don't know. I can just tell you. Wait a minute, did I say Nixon? Let me start with him. Turn on Johnson. Maybe he shouldn't have said what he said about Vietnam. Because Johnson had passed the Civil Rights Act of 64, the Civil Rights Act of 65, and he was working on the Civil Rights Act that became 68. When he signed it, he said, I'm going to lose the sign. He was paying a price. He had already said in a speech, we shall overcome. And he's from Texas. He knew people hated him. He was suffering. And he told Martin Luther King, work with me. But King felt, I can't tell these peace movement people that it's divided and disconnected and I ain't about them. I can't do it no more. I can't face myself. So he wouldn't have said that. And when he said that, Johnson began to pull back from him. And a lot, Johnson didn't want to see King again. He's like, you, you double crossed me. I'm paying all this price for you. I'm going through my own stuff. Robert Parker, his driver that wrote the book, The Capital in Black and White, said on the way to one of the speeches, he, he interrupted Johnson for the first time and said, no, I don't think that's right. And Johnson grabbed him by the collar and pulled him back and said, listen, don't you forget, you're still a negative. So Johnson was still working out his issues privately. I really don't care, because publicly, he was the greatest civil rights president we ever had. Ever had. Nobody gave people well, African American woman, nobody gave us what he did. And he was working through his racism. And when King did that, the establishment, the eternal. It's like, we didn't trust another black. In a way similar to when when uh, the Reverend uh, Leslie David Braxton led that march to the freeway and blocked the freeway. For a little while, the police and the mayor, nobody would talk to the black people. Like, we trusted you. You have blocked the freeway. That's a federal thing. You got the CNN, everybody looking at us. Will you do a march now? If we need to, we're going to have horses all around to build. So a little while to work through that. And um, I think he did the right thing, but I'm just wanting you to know that the system, there was always that conservative J. Edgar Hoover element that considered black people's liberation to be against what the country, against in America, and called Martin Luther King the greatest threat to internal security in the United States. When King did that, he moved out the way and let Hoover and the rest of them happen. And whatever it came out, that's what happened. And whatever it was, it was complex. For a little while, we had a 100 times disparity between powder, cocaine, mm -hmm. and crack sentencing. 100 to 1 for the same amount of substance. Because we knew black people were using crack. We put something sophisticated together. So at the end of the day, at the end of the day, a problem. So the key is to devise a system that recognizes this while not appearing to. And that's what they did. I ain't worried about that. Because I feel like I can't fight it anyway. I ain't worried about my invisible enemies that I can't see. I can't fight them anyway. I'm concerned about the stuff I can see. And I am focused on economic justice because I think that that is the I think that that is the most positive thing to help blacks in their development. I don't care what plan you put together against them. And I think Ethiopian, Eritrean, and Somali Americans are showing us right now that if you focus on your own economic development, 
you will make it against Stephen's racism. So when I'm around blacks, I tell them, no more excuses. I don't care. I don't care. I don't care. You can do it. They're doing it. I'm around non-blacks, I'm telling them, yeah, look into all these things and, and help these folks with economic justice. Help their businesses. Help them on this tunnel project right now where they've denied them all this money. Today. Today. Help them with sound transit where they're denying them all these contracts today. Help the ones you go to school with that are looking for a job just like you. Don't defend them when they're trying to find a job. Support them when you know of a job. Support their businesses. If you ain't helping them with this, you ain't helping them. That's what I said. What do you say? You guys might have to take off now. Those that take off, you guys take off, but I'm going to stick around for a little bit. Mm. Kelly might have to do her ending like she normally does. Kelly, yes, can you do your ending? You guys do your, they got a certain oh. ending that, you know what I mean? I don't no, want to mess that just, up. All we do is thank our speakers for coming. Oh, and that's what it is? Be mindful that about so next week's speaker. <laughs> and next week's speaker is? Is Jay McLean Riggs. And she's going to talk about uh, what the community yeah. college and higher education. So what's our role? Yeah, And that is a social issue. Right now, they're talking about taking the word community out of community colleges. Yeah. There's a long history of why they're called community yeah. colleges. And how this institution got started, which you will find very interesting. Yeah, that, that even has a Black Panther quote a little bit. Just a little bit. Blocking that yeah. growth up there. But um, you all can stay for a while and talk if you have time. And I do want to thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Kelly. Thank you for coming. Thank you for coming. Thank you for coming.